thing all languages have in common is their capacity to evolve. Many words can have different meanings depending upon the context. Speakers may use existing words in new ways or in combination with other words to produce a different meaning. A look through any language dictionary will show just how multifaceted some terms are. New ideas and discoveries may also lead to the creation of new words and phrases. All languages must evolve to reflect the needs of those wishing to communicate through them. In order for languages to fulfill their ultimate objective, that of widespread and clear communication, there needs to be some common understanding about language's constituent parts. Enter language experts and rules about spelling, diction or word choice, syntax, and more. But who decides how languages should evolve, or what word usage is correct or incorrect? Who gave these people the authority to decide the law of language? That is just the topic we shall explore in part three of this episode. Whether language should be the result of a completely organic or partly inorganic process is a heated topic for debate. The creators of dictionaries and style guides base their efforts on the need for consistency and clarity of language usage. The methodology used for compiling such works may seem mechanical, but even it must reflect the organic nature of language uses in making decisions about the definition of words, proper spelling, and possible variations of both. The movie The Professor and the Madman wonderfully portrays this dynamic in relation to the creation of a leading dictionary for the English language. In the Living Law Nation series, we explore the role of a number of institutions and bodies entrusted to protect and preserve the integrity of a certain language. Perhaps one of the best known such bodies is the Académie Française, whose roots go back to pre-revolutionary France. France as a country is notorious for laws which levy fines for failure to use French terms in certain settings. The French language became a global language, one which spread to other parts of the globe as a result of migration, exploration, and colonization. Since it was mainly European nations which expanded their power and influence during the period of exploration and colonization, most of the global languages are European. French, English, Portuguese and Spanish all spread to the Americas and parts of Asia. All also spread to Africa, with the exception of Spanish. English spread to India and Australasia as well. The rise of Islam brought Arabic across North Africa and beyond. The rise of Muscovy, and later the Soviet Union, contributed to Russian language usage extending from Eastern Europe to the Pacific Ocean and into Central Asia. Not surprisingly, five of these languages, along with Chinese, became official languages of the United Nations. The extension of languages beyond their birthplace, or place of origin, can have dramatic consequences for the native languages in a given area. In some cases, the new or immigrant language can come to rival the local tongues as demographics and social dynamics change. The Baltics provide a useful backdrop for looking at two kinds of language intervention. Measures aimed at ensuring consistency of usage and measures designed to preserve a language perceived to be under threat. Let's start with the first. As in France and other countries, 
there was an element of inorganic guidance or direction for the native languages. This period also ushered in a series of direct interventions in the evolution of the Latvian language, for which some background will be helpful. Historically, the Daugava River had always been the linguistic dividing line, with Finno-Ugric languages to the north and Baltic languages to the south. The Latvian language is a member of the Indo-European family, and evolved out of the various tongues of the Baltic peoples, including the languages of Liv and Lataglian, both of which enjoy protection under the modern Latvian language law. Historically, Latvia competed with German, which was the language of public administration, Latin, which was the language of the church, and later Russian, which also became the language of government and key industry. During the Soviet period, Russian became the main competitor in the language space. The Baltics also provide a good case study for how ideology can also be a factor in attempts at shaping language. Ethnic Latvians generally view the Soviet period as one in which their language and culture was sidelined, if not outright threatened. The Stalinist period saw the introduction of a language policy championed by Soviet academic Nikolai Marr. This policy entailed a focus on social strata, a blending of languages, Russified Latvian terms, and the direct transliteration or transposition of Russian terms into Latvian. In 1946, the rolling R was even prohibited as an overly bourgeois sound. In 1955, Russian became the official language of government administration. Arguably the greatest relevance language has in relation to government is whether citizens can receive public services and exercise their rights in their native tongue. If one language tends to sideline other languages widely spoken in a society, social and ethnic conflict may become inevitable. We saw that as well in the Baltics when there was a role reversal in the status of Russian and native tongues following independence. Since independence, it's the Estonian flag which flies here at Topea Hill. But what has independence meant for the local population, in particular the several ethnic minorities which live here in Estonia? The Russian ethnic minority makes up the largest group. And since independence, the Estonian government has passed a number of laws which some have claimed have had as discriminatory effects on the non-Estonian ethnic minorities. So we'll explore that topic, in particular in relation to legislation aimed at language requirements, in this segment. That brings us to the next sticking point, citizenship as such. When Estonia regained its independence, residents did not automatically receive citizenship. Instead, a naturalization process was instituted, which included a language requirement with a very high level of proficiency in Estonian. Russian speakers were deemed caught in a vicious circle, often not having the language skills required by the government to get many jobs, but at the same time unable to get these qualifications without the money to acquire them, either because they were already unemployed or poor. In the interim, state funding for language courses has improved the situation a bit. Statistics show that from 1989 to 2000, the percentage of ethnic Russians who speak and understand Estonian grew from 15 to 40 percent. But this was predominantly in the younger generations, so that language continues to be a divisive issue in the Baltics.
The combination of societal dynamics and official language policy can even drive some languages to the brink of extinction. Here as well, migration and imperialism were often the culprits. One of England's earliest ventures to expand its territory was to the neighboring island of Ireland. Though there had been contact between the peoples since time immemorial, things began to change when the objective shifted beyond trade to direct settlements. Concerns about the English settlers going native later caused the Crown to use the power of law to stop and reverse the trend. A key legal mechanism for Henry's conquest of Ireland was surrender and regrant. Following military capture, or the threat thereof, Irish chieftains were made an offer to accept English rule. They could retain their status, titles, and property by swearing allegiance to the crown. In return, they would receive the benefits of a guarantee of protection against attacks by Vikings or rival Irish clans. They would thus become part of a larger kingdom with representation in a pan-Irish parliament. Surrender and regrant was an attempt to change the legal framework in which the ethnic Irish lived and operated. It was an experiment in assimilation following the contentious delineation of the laws of the prior centuries, which clearly distinguished between loyal subjects and the so-called Irish enemies. But surrender came with a heavy price, including an oath of loyalty and rent due to the crown. It entailed a commitment to cease hostilities against residents of the Pale, the English settlements around modern-day Dublin. The members of the clans were expected to change their ways, adopting the English language, customs, and dress. The rights and privileges of clans accepting surrender and regrant were anchored in a royal charter documenting the agreement for all involved and for posterity. A turning point for Ireland, and for the native languages spoken on the island, came in the 17th century. The so-called plantations begun in the Elizabethan period initiated the gradual displacement of the local languages with English. There were periodic attempts by Irish chieftains to regain control of their lands, sometimes with assistance from the continent. Such efforts failed, however, and often triggered an even greater assertion of control by English forces. One particular turning point was the so-called Flight of the Earls, when the leaders of a failed rebellion fled to the continent in the hopes of gaining support for another try. But they never succeeded. The Crown took advantage of this situation to encourage the wholesale plantation of Ulster, spearheaded by the livery companies of London. In order to be eligible for a grant of land, a candidate had to be a speaker of English and a member of the Protestant Church. The body blow to the Irish language came in the middle of the 19th century with the Great Famine. Not only did this cost millions of people their lives, but it forced tens of thousands of others to seek their survival elsewhere. In the case of the Irish language, the combination of events relegated the local tongue mainly to the extremities of the island. As often happened with emigration, those leaving their homeland had to forego their native tongue in the process of assimilating to their newfound home. Upon gaining its independence, the Republic of Ireland inherited a society in which the overwhelming majority of citizens were no longer familiar with the native tongue of the island. 
Years of colonial policy promoting English, combined with the calamities of the famine and mass emigration, had reduced the Irish-speaking population to a tiny fraction of the whole. One of the priorities of early governments after independence was to try to rescue the Irish language. The constitution made Irish the primary language, and the educational policy focused on creating a new generation of speakers of Irish. Gaining independence meant that the leaders of the Irish Free State had the monumental task of reviewing all legislation from the period of British rule. And making decisions about what to retain, and what to change. There was a concerted effort to promote the use of the Irish language, and changes were made to the educational system. In 1955, the Republic of Ireland became a member of the United Nations. In 1973, Ireland, along with the UK, joined the European Community. This meant aligning its law to European law, within a mere five decades of gaining independence. Irish became an official language of the European Community, something which helped the efforts to preserve it. Today, Irish still continues to struggle for recognition and attention. Without government support, both domestically and from the European Union, the decline of the language would likely have accelerated. Because Irish is recognized as an official language of the European Union, financial support for educational and preservation efforts is available. The situation does beg the question as to whether there is a kind of point of no return for languages whose usage has been declining steadily for a long time. Supporters of the preservation measures point to the role of language in forming a basis for national identity. Many also see an intrinsic value in every language as one expression of the human experience. Detractors focus on the relative utility of learning a language with such a small community of speakers compared to a global language like English. So, is a common language a necessary feature of a sovereign nation? What factors should determine any choice of official or national language? An even greater example of efforts to revive a language is the nation of Israel in relation to Hebrew. If Irish represents a story where people try to prevent a language from dying, then Hebrew is an example of attempting to bring a language back from the dead. That is essentially what happened in the founding of the modern state of Israel. By the 20th century, Hebrew had long fallen out of daily use for most Jews, many of whom now resided outside the historical homeland of the Jewish people. Historians often point to the second destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem as the beginning of the gradual decline of Hebrew. As the Jews spread abroad, they generally adopted the language of the local population. Over time, Hebrew was almost exclusively reduced to use in religious rites and practices. In that sense, it bore parallels to Latin. Which had long stopped being a tongue of daily use, but was still relevant in Christian liturgies and administration. World War II and the Holocaust proved to be a turning point for Hebrew. Promoters of Zionism had long sought to establish a Jewish state in the traditional homeland of the Jews, at the time part of British-occupied Palestine. Initial efforts were underway before the tragic events unfolded in Europe. 
Yet even the movement's main 20th century protagonist, Theodor Herzl, did not contemplate Hebrew as the language of a future Jewish state. The original proposal was German, given the high number of German-speaking Jews on the European continent. That all changed in the post-war era. Thousands of Jewish refugees fled to the region to escape persecution and seek a new future. They came from all across Europe and thus spoke dozens of different languages, but not Hebrew. Yiddish was probably the most widely spoken, especially amongst the Jews of Eastern Europe. As fate would have it, there was already a Hebrew revival movement underway, led by people like Ben Yehuda. The drive to create a separate Jewish state proved to be the necessary catalyst for restoring Hebrew as a language of daily life. The example of Israel and Hebrew shows the unifying potential of language. The young Jewish state followed a policy of language induction in immigration and education as a means of integration and forging a common national identity. Linguists and scholars had to address some of the same issues as in the Irish example. New terms, clarity and consistency around grammar, a modern orthography, all were necessary pillars in enabling the return of Hebrew to a medium of daily discourse and exchange. If managing the course of a language or propping up its very existence may seem extreme, the next measure we will cover goes one step further. We saw in the first two segments how language has the potential to unite as well as to divide. Any language choices in multilingual societies run the risk of alienating particular language groups. Recognizing the divisive potential of language, some have tried to find common ground by creating an artificial language that everyone could use. That way, no particular language group in a society is given preference over others. The Age of Enlightenment gave rise to some philosophical languages, though none of these caught on. Later efforts led to proposals for artificial auxiliary languages such as Volapük. But a real breakthrough proved elusive. The frequent warfare of the 19th century strengthened the case for a universal language, even an artificial one. One of the most successful attempts at creating a universal language began in this period. Esperanto was the brainchild of a Polish doctor named Ludwig Lezer Zamenhof. The term Esperanto translates as the one who hopes. In 1887, Zamenhof published a book outlining the proposal for Esperanto, along with suggested terms and a simple grammar. In keeping with the goal of promoting peace by removing barriers, in this case the language barrier, the early supporters insisted on the neutrality of the initiative. It was to be a linguistic movement, not a political or ideological one. Borrowing the concept from some natural languages, they also set up a body to direct the evolution of Esperanto. The evolution of Esperanto reflected the historical developments in Europe. In the early 20th century, many pacifists supported the Esperanto project in the hopes of reducing violent conflict. This was the age of the creation of the Peace Palace in The Hague and International Courts of Justice. World War I highlighted the continuing need for better tools of diplomacy. Proponents of Esperanto held conferences and promoted the language in everyday life. But political division meant that Esperanto could be one more subject of disagreement between competing factions. 
In the run-up to World War II, right-leaning movements derided the Esperanto project and questioned the true motivations of its supporters. In Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler even portrayed it as part of the efforts of world Jewry to control the world. Joseph Stalin had some Esperanto supporters tried for treason and killed. After World War II, Esperanto began to grow, but remained a victim of political attribution. It enjoyed some popularity in the communist bloc, but was more of a cult phenomenon in the capitalist West. Though this did not prevent its growth even there, any political connotations tended to slow down its general acceptance. One major breakthrough occurred when one supporter raised his children in Esperanto, thus creating the first native speakers. Today, Esperanto is understood by an estimated 1 to 2 million persons worldwide. Its impact can be seen in the marketing of products globally. Some brands take their names directly from Esperanto terms. There were even attempts at creating universal means of payment. But overall, Esperanto lacks the institutional support required to establish it as a truly global language. Its Eurocentric nature meant that its main supporters were either from Europe or of European heritage. Its use of the Latin alphabet presents an obstacle to wide adoption in areas where the languages use other alphabets or characters. So will Esperanto go the way of some of humanity's dead languages? Or will it only thrive in small communities, failing to gain widespread international use? The answers to these and many other language questions may lie in technology. Software programs to translate from one language to another have made tremendous strides in recent years. As a traveler, it is amazing to see how basic scenarios of human interaction, such as placing an order or engaging in a transaction, can take place using such tools. Though they are still far from perfect, such tools may eventually make attempts at creating a universal language unnecessary. Living Law has mixed feelings on the topic. On the one hand, such technology may go some way in eliminating confusion based on language and thus reduce tensions globally. Fewer misunderstandings, fewer triggers of conflict. On the other hand, the diversity and beauty of individual languages is one of the key features of the human species. It is one of the few things which still distinguishes us from machines. At least for now. So on that note, it is time to close this Living Law topical episode on language. We will do so by hearing a few examples of languages encountered in the creation of the Living Law series. <laughs> What's your name so I can tell them? Kuriku. 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 I, I can't do it exactly. Okay. Say Saharias. What, what language is that? That is Tamara. 
Tamara. <laughs> I think I have to I have to practice. Vem com pé de rede, tirar na fotografia do cantador de repente. Se ele pega os 50 e botasse na mão. Dá o estipule da gente, deixa o cliente em paz. Deixa ficar à vontade, que ele sabe o que é que faz. Quem tem uma câmera dessa gasta milhões de reais. Ele tá aqui, me tá sama, sama ou luçana. O blitz é minha comédia, que ou luçana. Tava na semiga, bugue, bugue, mingue, segue, ou loucura. Tira a terça, viu, estrela, tem que vir do pé, verdune. Sorry, que era essa noite, tá pianista, balosta, pianista, só nós, tá rima, nos dos balosta. Tira a pica, e pulo, e a cai, cuja mãe se mama, na tela, e tu se vai, tu, ai, que haka sai, tu não é, tora lá, que a missa conta, tu não muda, que a terça, tu lhe flopa. Missa conta, outra cita aqui, nem mula, tá na ilha, mas tu liga, vai, vai. Do not be seen. Ela will like to be cool. You see the gold make you feel free.